So what we'll be doing in this lecture is going through a variety of examples pertaining to reliability analysis. And at the very end, I'll just kind of summarize the different types of improvements, um, improvement methodologies we could utilize um, to, to make our reliability better. And um, I'm going to go through four different examples. Uh, I'll start with Pew Savings case, uh, and then I'll switch to another uh, video segment, and I'll continue on with looking at fault isolation backfeeding. Uh, this, so that obviously, this is going to make use of some type of switching. And then in the last part, part C, I'll just kind of combine some of the concepts together, um, which kind of shows the value of switches in general, and then get into these improvement options. So let's take a look at a, a few savings case. And this is something that Mr. John Guida was talking about in his lecture on distribution system protection. And the reason we're so interested in this is many faults on distribution circuits turn out to be temporary in nature. If I could de-energize the circuit and re-energize it, that fault will go away. Sometimes it's referred to as a self-healing fault. And so this could be due to lightning or temporary animal contact or temporary tree contact if there's wind blowing the trees into the wires. And so what Mr. Guida talked about was a, a situation where I would have an upstream reclosing device. This could be a line recloser. Or this could actually be a station circuit breaker. And what we would have downstream is a protected section that's protected by a fuse. And so if this fault at this location turns out to be temporary, instead of having this fuse act too quickly and just clear that fault right away, what we do is use a slower fuse and let the upstream reclosing action of the breaker clear that fault instead. Now, the number of times we're gonna be doing the clearing in order to remove a temporary fault is it's, it's referred to as a shot. This is a terminology that gets used called a shot. And so you might, utility might use one, two, three shots. And then after that, it'll switch the curve in the recloser and it'll uh, go to a slower curve and it'll force that fuse to blow. So if it's temporary, the recloser will clear the fault. If it's permanent, the fuse will end up blowing. And so anyway, this concept is what's referred to as fuse savings, all right? So just because you have an upstream breaker and a fuse doesn't mean that fuse savings is activated. You have to have the right fuse in place. You have to have the logic and the recloser set up. That's why in the previous example, example one, we had a situation where we had no fuse savings. The fuse would blow for any type of fault, but now we're gonna look at what happens when we have fuse savings set up. Uh, one thing I wanna mention is that it's not always possible to do fuse savings. If we run into a situation where we're at the top of the feeder, sometimes that fault current is so high that we, we can't get the right type of coordination, the fuse is gonna blow right away anyway. Um, and so we don't always have few savings done uniformly on a whole distribution feeder. We might pick our spots that we want to have the few savings at, and other spots we may not have few savings. So the reliability data that we're going to have for this first example is going to be the same as what we had um, before in the, in the part one presentation. And note again what I'm doing as far as the data is I've got a length for each segment. I've got a temporary failure rate and I've got a permanent failure rate. Probably if we had a more realistic data set, you would expect to see two to three times more temporary faults and permanent faults, but it just depends. It just depends on the situation. We have a probability of an open circuit failure. This doesn't not cause a fault, but it results in an outage. And then we have a mean time to repair the fall of the segment and we have a mean time to switch for a crew to go to that particular switch that's upstream of the fault and actually operate that device. And so we'll have this statistical information for all the different elements in the circuit. Now every element actually has a failure rate, but we're focusing on these examples on the elements that would most likely fail. 
So we're going to have other sort of failures, but the probability of those failures are pretty low compared to like overhead line or cable failures. Something else we also need to have too is we need to know something about customer counts before because our indices are weighted by the number of customers in various locations in the circuit. So the way we would do this again, and this is I'm just going to kind of review this one more time, is we would start off by computing the various types of contingencies and the number of times those contingencies would actually occur. So if I've got three line segments and all I'm considering are failures on line segments, then I'm going to have contingency locations for line one, two, and three. I'm going to have temporary faults. I'm going to have permanent faults. I'm going to have the possibility of passive failures. And so if I look at line segment number one, basically I would go to the temporary failure rate, which is one per kilometer per year, I multiply by the length of the line, and that's going to give me one failure per year, okay, or one fault per year. And so that's where this number comes from. I can look at the same data for permanent faults. I have one failure per year per kilometer. I multiply that by the line length. And that gives me one fault per year. These don't have to be round, rounded off integer numbers. These could be just regular floating point numbers. We have no passive failures and just, just kind of help me do the bookkeeping. I put the mean time to repair. So anytime I would have a permanent fault, it would take me two hours to repair that fault. Do the same thing for line number two. Basically go to my data and calculate the number of these fault events I'm going to have per year, and then go to line section number three and do the same. Now, line section number three, we, we've got for temporary faults is we have two faults per kilometer per year, and when I multiply that by the, the line length of two kilometers, what this is going to give me is the four faults per year. Similarly, I do that for permanent faults. I have four faults per year. Passive failures, I have one failure per year. And this is kind of typical of what you would actually see on distribution circuits in that we typically are going to have more failures on these tapped laterals. This, this would be a, a kind of a tapped lateral in this case where uh, maybe this is for like a residential area. And we, we typically will work pretty hard of keeping trees away from our main feeder. But when it comes to the laterals, that's actually more difficult to do because these lines are kind of snaking in and out, you know, on residential streets and you have trees and it's, it's sometimes hard to keep those trees cleared as well. So it's not unusual that for our taps, we would have these higher failure rates. I kind of like putting all this information into a table. It helps with the bookkeeping. And so you note what I have is I have the seven different types of events. All right, seven different types of events that could occur for these three line segments. And what I'm simply doing is I'm simply entering in the number of these events I'm going to have per year. And again, this does not have to be an integer number. And so what I'll do for each of these events is I'll go ahead and I'll fill out the table regarding the number of times the circuit breaker is going to operate, whether it's going to lock out, whether we have a fuse operator blow. Um, and then we track the counts on customer A and B in terms of what customer A is going to see versus customer B. And on a practical circuit, I mean, we could have maybe, you know, 500 customer locations. And so, you know, there's a lot of bookkeeping associated with this. And so, this table will work for a smallish circuit, but when you get up larger in size, I mean, this has to be all computer code. So in working this particular problem, um, let's kind of take a look at how we populate the table. And we'll just focus on line one and line two, and we'll look at temporary faults. So again, if I have a temporary fault, that's a fault that could be cleared by a reclosing operation at the station breaker. We don't really even have to have few savings set for this. I mean, anything that's on the main feeder can be cleared by the, the station circuit breaker. And this is normally the case. We'll normally have reclosing activated for the station breaker. So if I have a temporary fault on here, what happens is the relay senses the fault current. It 
goes through and operates the breaker open. After a certain period of time, we close the breaker. And again, if it's a temporary fall, then hopefully that fall will be gone. If not, we have to maybe try a few more times. So what's gonna happen in this case is for this one temporary fall, if this breaker opens and closes, this customer at load A and load B and load A, they're gonna see a blink, right? And so they're gonna see for line number one, for one temporary fault, what we're gonna see is we're gonna have one circuit breaker operation. It's not gonna lock out. It's not gonna be any fuses operate. Customer A is you're gonna increment the momentary count by one and customer B you're gonna increment the momentary count by one. You do exactly the same thing if you're gonna have a temporary fault on line section number two. So you have net two momentary events for these two temporary faults, but then if you put this into the table, you can, you can see an entry, individual entry for, for each fault type. You can do the same thing for line number three. This is going to be different than what we saw for the example in the previous lecture, because before, if I had a temporary fault on line three, this would blow the fuse. Now what's going to happen is we have fuse savings in effect. So what's gonna happen is the circuit breaker is gonna see the fault current. It's gonna operate more quickly than that fuse can blow. And so what's gonna happen is that circuit breaker is gonna go through a shot. It's gonna open up, it's gonna close back in again. And then hopefully that temporary fault will be gone and we'll be back to normal again. If we have four temporary faults on line number three, assuming everything operates correctly, then this is gonna result and for momentaries. Now, one thing that's different than what we had before in the previous lecture is since the circuit breaker is operating, every single customer on that feeder is going to see a momentary outage. Every single customer is going to see a blink. So if you've done a poor job of trimming trees around line section number three, all the other customers kind of suffer in a way and that they're gonna see these momentary operations of the circuit breaker as well. And so this is where you kind of get into, you know, maybe you wanna think about having some other devices in the circuit to keep these other customers from seeing so many momentary events, but that, you know, that's a subject for, um, you know, maybe like a homework problem. And so we, we can process this and we can put this information into our table, then we go, um, look at the total number of the temporary faults and we basically see now that for these temporary faults we're not getting any sustained outages but we get a lot of momentary outages. It's going to contribute to our MAFI number, it's not going to contribute to our SAFI or SADI numbers. But there's a trade-off. Basically the trade-off is that now even though load A doesn't see as many sustained outages, load B is going to see more momentaries. We can process the permanent faults. So if we have a permanent fault on line section number one, what's actually going to happen is we're going to go through some attempts by the circuit breaker to clear the fault because the circuit breaker relay doesn't know whether it's a temporary or permanent fault. So it's going to go through a number of reclosing shots and eventually what's going to happen, the circuit breaker is going to um, lock out, right? It's going to um, not try to reclose anymore, assuming we just have a, a permanent fault there. And basically what's going to happen if I have this one permanent fault, the circuit breaker is going to lock out and it's going to take us two hours to fix that. And so that's going to result in two hours of outage time for both these customers. So if you go to the table, this happens one time a year for just the event on line section number one. We're gonna get one circuit breaker operation. We're gonna get one lockout. Uh, we're not gonna have any fuse operations. And then what customer A is gonna see is customer A is gonna see a sustained outage that's gonna result in customer out being for two hours. And then we're gonna have a uh, sustained outage for customer B and they're going to be out for two hours. Okay, so this is how you fill in the table. You do exactly the same for same thing for line section number two. And then when you're 
putting this in a spreadsheet, then you could be updating these indices as you're doing this. And then for the fault on line section number three, if it's a permanent fault, you get the same outcome as we had before in the, in the previous example. Um, basically, what's going to happen in this case is that the circuit breaker is going to try to clear that fault thinking it might be temporary. But what's eventually going to happen is it's going to stop trying to clear the fault and just go ahead and let that fuse blow. And so given that that fuse blows, then we're going to have a permanent outage on line number three. And if I have four permanent faults per year, we're going to get four outages. If it takes four hours to fix each outage, that's a total outage hours of 16. Now, in this scenario, because we had this circuit breaker set up for fuse savings, that circuit breaker is going to try to clear the fault first. That means that customers at load B see blinks, they see momentaries. And so one thing is a little bit different in this case, given that we attempted to do the fuse savings, is that customer at load B is going to see four momentary outages associated with those four faults on line section three. Okay, so this is the, the kind of the trade-off here. Again, the, the trade-off is we're um, basically to get less fuse blowing, we have to live with more momentary blinks. So these are the sums of the permanent fault contributions. If you add these all up, you could put this into the table I showed you before. You could process the passive failure just like we had in the example in part number one. There's no change in this case. This is going to happen one time per year. It's going to take four hours to fix, but it doesn't impact low B any. And when you um, then compute the system indices, when you're computing like the SAFE and the SADI and MAFI, then you basically add up the impact of all these different contingencies. And for load A, you have six momentaries. For load B, you'll have 10. For load A, you'll have seven sustained outages. And note that if we have an event on load A that's related to uh, fuse, fuse savings, if the upstream breaker operates and eventually the fuse blows, we don't count that at A as a momentary. All we count is the worst case thing that happened, which is a sustained outage. So if you're going to have a sustained outage, you don't care whether there's any previous momentaries or not, because if they're have a sustained outage, nobody's going to care if they got blinked before. This is going to happen so fast. Basically, it's going to, from their standpoint, it's just going to look like the power um, went out for, for um, you know, the time it takes to do the repair. So we can, we can substitute into the equations for safety, SADI, and MAFI. So for safety, again, we take the, the number of sustained outages on load A multiplied by the number of customers at A take the sustained outage count for load B, multiply that by the number of customers, we normalize by the total number, and we get an average of 2.45 interruptions per year. Uh, similarly, for the safe SADI number, then you're going to have 24 outage hours, which is actually pretty high. Uh, multiply that by 50 customers, add to that the number of outage hours for load B, um, multiply that by the number of customers, add these two numbers together, and we, we normalize by the total customer count, which is going to give us 5.8 hours per year. One thing I want to point out here as well is that if you have a lot of customers on a circuit, and if you just had a few customers with a really high outage hour, note because you're averaging over the total number of customers that this high number may not be reflected in the net SADI for the circuit or say like the substation. And so this is one thing you have to kind of look at is you could have a, a couple really poor quality customers on a circuit that may not necessarily even have a high SADI index. Um, and, and so sometimes you have to have some screening in place to kind of you know look for some of these worst case pockets on a, on a large circuit. Uh, and then you could also calculate the MAFI number, and this is 9.64 interruptions per year. So if you look at the protection device operation counts, 
which you can get from the table. Uh, the circuit breaker is going to operate at least 12 times. This is going to include two lockouts. It might actually operate more because sometimes in clearing the temporary vents, you know, we've got to go through maybe two or three different shots. And then the fuse is going to operate four times. And this means we have to have a crew go out and replace it. And so as Mr. Uh, Guida indicated that there's a replaceable fuse link in these cutouts. And basically the crew takes a hot stick, it, it removes the fuse link, the, the little element that blew replaces the fuse link in it and then uses a hot stick and, to push it back up um, into the cutout again. And then this is the contingency table. And so when I put all these different events uh, all this different event information in here, I can get the grand total right here. And then I could use the grand total information and weigh it by the customer counts in order to compute these different indices. Okay, so as far as a summary of this, when we have the few savings, uh, these are the, the indices we get. Uh, safety of 5.8, safety of 2.45. Note in the case we went through in the part one lecture, similar scenario with no few savings, the safety was 7.3 and the safety was 2.81. The MAFI was two, all right? So we're basically able to improve, we're able to improve our safety number by going with the few savings. Our safety number drops a little bit, but not really by that much. But what we're sacrificing here is we're getting a lot more momentary events, a lot of these more MAFI events on this particular circuit. And so the few savings is, is beneficial that it, it cuts down on the on the safety number, improves safety somewhat. We have less truck rolls to the field. But if I've got power quality sensitive customers on circuits, which we'll talk about in the future lecture, if I got power quality customers on circuits. If you have a blink that could mess up an industrial process, just like a sustained outage, depending on, on the type of um, process going on. And so this is something as a reliability engineer, you'd be looking at as far as trade-offs, you know, given that, you know, where the customers are at and the types of events that would happen, what customers are sensitive to what types of events. If you have certain customers sensitive to, to momentaries, then you kind of figure out what you want to do as far as what sections of the circuits have few savings and what sections of the circuit don't. And again, you can mix and match. You, you could actually set a feeder up or if you have your feeder that and you have all these different laterals you can actually make it where you know some sections have no few savings and other sections have few savings. You can actually have a hybrid approach. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll stop this video segment here and in part B we'll go into another example involving switching.